Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. We've just had a couple of talks about borders and us versus them. I'm going to tell you about some stuff that we're trying to do to change perspectives and maybe do something about that. SETI Quest, a community we're trying to bring the world in to help us, all right? So I'm really pleased to be here. So where's here? Well, it's the Bovard Auditorium. But as the news from the tragedies in Japan and the revolutions in the Mideast and uh, the realities of climate change are reminding us, we're also here. And when the Cassini spacecraft went by Saturn, it looked back through the rings and it imaged us here. And in 1990, as the Voyager 1 spacecraft was leaving the solar system on its way past Neptune, it turned homeward and it imaged us here. And we're here, right, at the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, and ultimately we're here in at least one universe. So it's all about perspective. And perspective can change, perspective can be changed. And I like to look at this and think that we live in a fragile island of life within a universe of possibilities. Now, after 25 years, in uh, March of 2009, NASA launched this spacecraft called Kepler. And Kepler is now beginning to show us some of the amazing possibilities in our universe. Kepler's job is to find small, Earth-like planets around other stars. And it does it by waiting for some of those stars to wink. So for some stars and some planets, the orientation is such that the planet will pass in front of the star. And when it does, it dims the light from the star. And for a few hours, the starlight is dimmer. And then when the planet comes around, it does it again. Now that illustration, which was up on the screen, made it look like a simple job to look for these transits. But it's not at all. When a big planet like Jupiter goes in front of a star like the sun, it blocks 1% of the light, a part in 100. But when the Earth goes in front of the sun, it only blocks a part in 100,000. So the precision of Kepler's movie cameras has to be phenomenal indeed. And of course, not all stars and not all planets are appropriately aligned, so Kepler's got to look at a lot of stars. Well, in the summer sky at night when you look up, you can see this band of the Milky Way here beautifully stretching between Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen in Northern California. And this is where stars live. So this is where Kepler needs to be looking. Kepler is actually looking at a patch of sky that's about 100 square degrees across. That's the size of your hand at arm's length. And those 42 little rectangles there uh, are actually arrays of CCD detectors that are part of Kepler's cameras. CCD detectors, exactly the same sort of thing that makes that cell phone camera that just flashed work. Um, and Kepler's cameras don't have three megapixels or 10 megapixels. They've got 95,617,600 pixels. And Indeed, they work. This is the first light image we saw when they ejected the lens cover from Kepler after a few days after launch. In that image, there are four and a half million stars brighter than a certain level. And Kepler is staring continuously at 165,000 of those stars constantly, and as a result of two quarters of data taking with Kepler, we now know that 1,235 of those stars are actually winking at us. This is a diagram that shows the location of 1,235 exoplanet candidates 
that Kepler announced on the 1st of February. And they're color-coded by the size of the planet. Actually, I have a cheat sheet here. There are 184 that are as big or bigger than Jupiter. 662 are about the size of Neptune. 288 are a size of planet that we actually don't have in our own solar system. We call them super Earths. They're a bit bigger than Earth. And actually 68 are about the same size as our own planet. I'm really jazzed by this. Here's another way of looking at Kepler's results. This is the image of the shadows of those 1,235 planets projected onto the disk of their stars. And the, the relative size of the disk shows you how big the star is. The relative size of the shadow shows you how big the planet is. And for comparison, here's us. There we are. You can see that some of the stars are bigger than the sun but most are far smaller. And right now we're dealing with data that would allow us to know about stars that have periods that are 25 days or less. As Kepler's mission goes on, we're gonna learn about planets that have periods like a year, like the Earth. Um, maybe you can see a black dot on that image. Here it is, that big black dot, that's what Jupiter looks like against our sun. Here's where we are. Now, Kepler has been just amazing us with these worlds that it's been showing us. We expected to be surprised, but in fact, 54 of these worlds we expect will be in the right place around their stars to perhaps have liquid water on the surface. The Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. But more than that, these planets and their orbital dynamics are just amazing. Look at this. We are just blown away by what we're learning. When I see this and think about what's going on with those worlds revolving around their stars, I think of that line from Contact where she says, they should have sent a poet. This is amazing stuff. And Kepler reminds us daily that it is so difficult from a single example to try and to predict the various possibilities out there in nature. We're learning that stars don't stay where, that planets don't stay where they're born. Giant planets born at the outskirts of their stellar systems wander in close to their stars. Some of them go too far and have already been consumed. Some of them have been ejected into the space between the stars. Kepler amazes us. So, Kepler's field of view is about one four hundredth of the sky and its stars are pretty far away. You put those together and the Kepler scientists can calculate that there are probably at least 50 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. Probably 500 million of those might be habitable. So this is the perfect time to re-ask the old question. Are we alone? Is it only just us in this vast sea, this cosmos of energy and chemistry and physics? Is it only us? Are we alone? Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. <laughs> so my colleagues at the SETI Institute, who are astrobiologists, are trying to think about ways to image some of these worlds around other stars and look for signs of biology, to look for signs of life. And they'll do that by trying to study the atmosphere of these planets' chemistry and see if it's like the Earth. See if it's got really weird chemistry like oxygen from plants and cyanobacteria and methane from methanogens, the guts of termites and cow fart, right? We want to see if there are some biosignatures on the world, those worlds. But it's going to take new spacecraft and at least a decade 
to get there, to look for these biosignatures. But what if on those worlds there aren't just microbes? What if they're mathematicians? What if they're engineers? What if we, in fact, could use the technology of the 21st century to scientifically explore, to see if we can find evidence of someone else's technology? That's what SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is all about. We're looking for techno-signatures. Now, our technology is visible over interstellar distances, so it's not unreasonable to, to think that theirs might be as well. A vast communications network, some sort of shield against asteroidal impacts, something totally unknowable and unforeseeable that might give out signals either at optical or radio wavelengths that, that a determined program of searching might uncover we might be able to find them. What's going to be the key to success in that search? The key to success is longevity. The whether two technologies can discover one another is going to depend on the mean distance between technologies in our galaxy. Now that's a distance over space and a distance through time. So longevity is going to be the key. Unless technologies survive for a long time, there will never be two that are close enough together to detect one another. Phil Morrison said this in a very powerful way. He said, SETI is the archaeology of the future. Because of the finite speed of light, any information we get will be telling us about their past. But if we detect a signal, it will tell us that it's possible for us to have a long future. It will answer that question. We are a young technology in a very old galaxy. We don't know whether technologists and technology can persist for a long time. But the detection of a signal answers that question. So we've been doing SETI for 50 years. Um, since the first radio search by Frank Drake in 1960. But if you use the Earth's oceans as an analog, the amount of searching we've done is equivalent to taking one glass out of the cosmic ocean and exploring that. We actually haven't begun to search. But the technologies of the 21st century are allowing us to build better tools, better glasses, bigger glasses, ones that we can scoop up faster. And so even though there's a daunting task ahead, our tools may be up to the job. This telescope is called the Allen Telescope Array. It's the first phase of a larger array that was funded by Paul Allen and it is the first time we've ever built a large radio telescope by building a large number of small telescopes, hooking them together with computers and making silicon as important as aluminum and steel. The SETI signal detection software on that telescope in real time looks for patterns in noise that can be made by technologies, but as far as we know, can't be made by nature. So what you're looking at here is the carrier signal from the Voyager 1 spacecraft, which is now on the brink of the interstellar medium. It's leaving our planetary system. It is the most distant human object. It's traveled farther than any other object. And so its signal is getting weaker. Perhaps you can see it in this plot, but our computers find it very easily because we tell them what to look for. And so we have good algorithms for finding this kind of artifact. But we now have better computing capabilities, and we wonder what other kinds of signals might we look for. What if we're looking for the wrong thing? What else might be there? Um, so we are trying to build 
a new project. And it's the reason that I asked the TED community in 2009 to empower Earthlings everywhere to become active participants in the ultimate search for cosmic company because I wanted to change the world. Now, this wish might not be, it might not be obvious to you how this could change the world, but I think it can. I think it will, right? So, um, as a first action, speaking louder than words, I challenge you all to go back and edit your Facebook and your Twitter and your LinkedIn or whatever profiles and add the word Earthling <laughs> to your description. And then think about what you just did. All right? We have put our data and our code out there on the web to allow folks with technical skills to help us improve what we're doing. But we're also building a citizen science project to capture the passion of the crowd and their pattern recognition skills. Uh, we want them as volunteers to work alongside us in real time to look through the data to find patterns for which we yet have no algorithms, to look through parts of the data that are so full of signals that it confounds our detectors. We want them to help us discover a signal from an extraterrestrial technology. And we want to change their perspective and particularly the perspective of the next generation. Because after all, these are the key to our longevity. And so we have a nice uh, beta application on mobile Android devices. And uh, if I hadn't left my charger in Oxford, England, I would be showing it to you here on the stage. But you can go online. So action number two, sign up to beta test the SETI Quest Explorer and help us understand how, how to help people find signals that our machines miss. We're really excited about the Kepler Worlds, about this application, about where we are. Um, we have, for the first time, we know where to point our telescopes. We have a two-year plan to search these 1,235 Kepler Worlds. We have successfully building tools and opportunities to get the world involved. Um, but we hit a kind of a roadblock. Uh, we're actually having to hibernate the telescope that I told you about because of the California and federal funding situations. So when will we come out of hibernation? That kind of depends on you. So here's action number three. Get involved with us. Let's figure out a way to keep this two-year program at functioning and going because it's important. It's important for changing perspectives. We've seen over millennia how when you take a small island of life and you chop it up into smaller islands and tribes, how bad things can get. We want to get people to understand that ultimately we only belong to one tribe, to the earth, and we owe it to one another to celebrate the things that are the same about ourselves rather than our differences. So SETI is a mirror that has the opportunity to show us ourselves from an incredibly different perspective. And in so doing, in involving the world in this search for others, perhaps we can trivialize the differences among ourselves. And if SETI never detects a signal, it could succeed tomorrow or it could never succeed. But even if all it did was to share this perspective with everyone on the planet, it would have been one of the most profound undertakings of humankind. So I encourage you to join us and let's change the world. Thank you. Astronomers get to do the real cool, pretty presentations, don't they? Um, I 
am just wondering how over time have, has our conception of what habitable means and what technology or technological means? Because a lot of times we tend to anthropomize things and we want to anthropomorphize things and we want to imagine that they have two eyes and two legs. How, are, how have things changed? They've changed enormously in many ways. We, we had this um, bias about thinking of the ascent of man or woman, right? Mm -hmm. We're the pinnacle of evolution. That's a viewpoint that nature does not share with us, right? <laughs> and what we are finding on this planet are forms of life, primarily microbial, that exist in environments that are so inhospitable to us. But in fact, this is the world. The world is microbial. Extremophiles are showing us that life can exist in a huge variety of conditions and maybe planets out there that don't look at all like the Earth. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we have the scientific understanding that says how evolution works, how we fit into that larger scale of evolution, and how, on a molecular level, we are all the same. <laughs> it's just the brain that isn't yet willing to accept that message, but that's what we're trying to get out there. Great, thank you so much. That was really interesting. You're welcome.